So, good morning, everyone. Hope you can hear and see me all right this morning. It's Friday morning, and I'm happy to tune in with you one last time to the Buddhist teachings for this week. And we're going to talk about clarity, the precious quality of clarity today, how to probably mm, nourish it in our lives, and what we can do in those moments where obviously uh, we are having very little of it. So, my name is Ulla Koenig, and I'm here in southern Germany, and I welcome you to join me in this session. If you have any technical problems, let's start with the nitty-gritty of the framework. Uh, you go to the chat box and you let me know that you can't see me, that you can't hear me, that something is off. It might be on my side, it might be on your side, and the lovely Sangha will most probably lend a hand to clarify what we can do about that. Then, next thing is questions, sharings, reflections on the teachings, on the whole of this week, maybe, are so much welcomed. Um, again, in the chat box, and if you write um, with it in capital letters, something like reflection, or comment, or idea, um, I will know that uh, I can get back to you, and most probably I will do that in the last third of our session, in the last 20 minutes, where the first 20 minutes are basically me talking a bit about the concept of clarity, then we're going to meditate on that, and then we are going to yeah, have this last final sharing today. Okay, so let's dive right in this morning. Let's dive right in and see... Um, how to explore and play with and experiment with this quality of clarity. So talking about moha, this um, yeah, mind state, inner dynamic drive, which we were looking into all week, um, which can be translated as uh, ignorance or confusion or blindness or not knowing. Yeah, And we had also an aspect of preferring of to, not to know, yeah, all this <clears throat> inner entanglement um, can bring the impression that there is a lot of stress and problematic and challenge within, yeah, that whew, we're kind of the guardians of this mess, <laughs> this inner mess. And I like to finish on a different bit of a different um, tone today to say, yes, there are challenging qualities within, yeah, challenging states, for sure, we all have that, and we have also beautiful qualities, all at hand, yeah, all at hand. It's not that any one of us is lacking kindness, it's not that any one of us is lacking calm or clarity, it is kind of that the nurturing, the beautiful qualities can't shine through if there is a lot of uh, ignorance and aggression and wanting going on. Yeah, so they are just covered over. All is fine. And today I want to emphasize this quality of court, which is called a moha, which put the Buddha put as an opposite to the blindness, the not knowing, the confusion and delusion. A moha is simply the opposite of that. And what is that opposite? Well, it's again many things. Um, one thing is to have this form of clear presence. Yeah, Cl Clarity I would define as a clear presence, a knowing and a seeing of something. You might have seen it in your practice, and I think that is a wonderful little moment when that comes up, that there can be a dynamic which can cause a lot, us a lot of trouble, like whew, the anxiety about our lives, or um, the conflict with someone. And as soon as we touch it upon it, it's like Pandora's box opens up and we get completely entangled with it. And if we come for one reason or another to a point where there's a lot of inner stability and nourishment and ease, that theme might pop up. The mind brings up things quite regularly. Yeah. We're not the owners of those impulses. It brings it up again. Oh, we could think about that conflict once more. <laughs> it pops up. And rather than grasping upon it and 
thinking about it and reproducing it, um, the awareness is so strong and we're so centered that we can just say, oh, thought has arisen. Thought about conflict has arisen. And there is a knowing and there is a seeing and there is a not fabricating and not doing anything about that. I don't need to think that right now. I don't need to go down that storyline. Would it be helpful? Mm, not really. Thought about that 100 times. Um, I'm not willing to go into the same stories. I can, I'd rather think about consequences. I'd rather think about what in my needs and values I have to treasure, but I don't need to go down that storyline. Yeah. So that something productive starts to grow. And in this clarity, there's a healthy distance, a healthy distance. It's not a shying away from, it's not a pushing away. It's a healthy distance towards the experience. We all have this concept of having too many trees in front of us so that we can't see the whole forest. Yeah. And the same is often the case with our, with our experience that, um, we're way too close. Yeah. We're way too close. It's so easy for the experience to draw us, draw us in. Yeah. So easy for the story to become truth, for a view to become truth, for an assum assumption to become truth. Yeah. And clarity allows us to reestablish that healthy distance. And that has almost been a mindful play with myself to say that a new experience comes up and can I fathom out? It's more on a somatic felt sense rather than on a cognitive level. Can I figure out how much, how much of a distance I have upon this, of, of, upon this experience? Am I whoa, feeling the whole body is almost drawn towards that or mm, pushing away with it? Yeah. Or do I notice that, yeah, there is this experience and there is also my body. I can also reconnect to my breathing. I can also notice the air around. That is a healthy distance. Or am I collapsing, drawn into it? Very helpful little practice to just recognize that. So clarity is not a character trait of yours or a state you can miraculously tap in. It is actually a practice. And I find that a huge relief. It's not something some of us have and others unfortunately don't. Yeah. But it's something we can cultivate, practice and develop. And for me, it all starts with realizing the huge value clarity has in our lives. To see how First of all, pleasant it is to have some state of clarity and calmness and to really celebrate that. Oh, it feels, if it's there, and it, it pops up occasionally, say, oh, wonderful. It feels great to feel like integrity is there, stability is there, clarity is there, calmness is there. It feels not only because on a moralized level it, it's it's supposed to be good to have clarity. No, it, it really feels good. <laughs> it really feels good and to tap into that. And there is also some form of, of, of self-respect and a, a possibility to trust and rely on, on the mind, on the heart mind in this situation. I can rely on my mindfulness in that state. I can rely on the integrity in that state. And there is something a teacher of mine once called basic sanity. You know, I'm not that ping pong ball at the moment. I'm not this pushing and pulling. There is a level of integrity, a level of stability within me, something we could call basic sanity. And to really value and treasure that. And if we do that, we then might, in the mid, in the middle of our days, make small, minor choices. It's not about this. I can't decide to be cl have clarity. Yeah, I want to make that very clear. I can't decide to have clarity. I can't decide to have basic sanity. And all of us will, to a different degree, over the days, the weeks, the months, experience states of absolute non-clarity, states of experiences of depressive moods to some degree, experiences of anxiety to some degree, experiences of thick, dense storytelling and narratives to some degree. 
degrees of pushing and pulling and wanting and not wanting. And that is normal and that is human. Now, let me make that very clear. So we can't decide not to have that. What we can do is in the nitty gritty with a lot of trust and patience, put seeds for more clarity to arise. Even though there is this depressive mood and even though there is this anxious feeling, I'm setting seeds to make it more likely, more probable that there will be 1%, 5%, 10% more clarity tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, whatever it is. So it's a practice. And it's a very, it's a practice where we need some patience and some trust. But uh, we can almost celebrate the act of putting wholesome seeds into the soil of our heart minds. That is already something to celebrate each day, even though there was the anxiety, even though there was the anger, there was still the capacity to take three breaths and calm myself a little. Even though there was this wanting of something, I was able to feel the weight of my whole body in my feet for a second or two before I said something, did something. Great. These are the seeds which we put into the ground. And that can be and should be really celebrated, especially in times where the dynamics are strong, where the current is strong, to celebrate that which we do even though it is challenging. Okay. The whole process of practicing clarity starts with a capacity to be able to differentiate states of confusion and states of non-confusion. Yeah. Um, it always comes on a scale and we are all shifting even throughout the day, maybe the hour between those poles. Very natural. Yeah. And it's not on our choice only. It also depends a lot on our, on the circumstances and the conditions we live in and experience. So don't put too much of a pressure upon yourself. Pardon me. <coughs> um, but what you can do is to notice where on the scale am I right now? How does it feel like when I'm rather clear and stable? Yeah, how does basic sanity feel like? What is its somatic sense? What is how are the what are the thoughts like? What views arise with it? And how am I able to be present and connect with experiences? Yeah, and you will notice a, a huge difference towards states of confusion and um, blindness and drivenness, where the heart mind can be quite obsessive. I need to think this. It's not allowed to put that thought down. It's not okay not to do that. Um, and to just notice this drivenness we can sometimes have. And the density and the intensity of experience. To say, oh, all that is part of moha. And in the image, imaginary word of the Buddha, he spoke about um, Mara as this personification of moha, of blindness, of ignorance. And he often, 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 often in his practice, he just said, I see you, Mara. I see you, Mara. And when we see something, we are not it anymore. We take an observant stand. By, by seeing something, we almost take a step backward. And, yeah, I see you. I recognize the dynamic. I see you, Mara. And you just want me to convince. You want to convince me to think that thought once more. And in just this little step backwards, yeah, uh, we can get some perspective back. Some perspective back, which is already precious. Go for the small percentages, not for the, for the ideals. The second step is to notice when you lose clarity. Yeah, the loss of clarity will happen, as I said, many times over the day. And in those moments, as I said, just an awareness of the thinking mind. What views, what assumptions, what stories is your, is the unclear, the confused mind selling to you? I, I did a little play with my son yesterday. We drove home with the bus. And we recognized how many billboards there actually are confronting us with advertisement constantly. Yeah, just, just a 15 minutes ride with the bus and 
gosh, I think there were over 50 billboards with different things. And I said to my son, yeah, um, we can play a game. We, um, all those billboards are little traps, yeah, where, um, advertisement wants you to buy something, your precious money. Um, he gets once a week from me and he can go and buy something for himself. I said, well, watch out. What do they want to you to give your money to? And then he was, he was, um, very happy with that game. So he said, Oh, they want me to buy, um, alcohol and they want me to buy sweet things and they want me to buy bread and I'm not giving my money to any of them. <laughs> and he became really, really fierce about that. And I think the same we can do with the stories and interpretations and assumptions of my mind to say, Oh, I noticed the um, emotional charge. I noticed the, the, the lack of clarity at the moment. And I notice the fierceness with which my mind wants me to believe and see and judge certain things myself, situations, etc. Yeah. And based on almost the somatic feeling of confusion, I shall not trust that. I shall not fully believe that. Yeah. I might not be as bad. The situation might not be as dangerous. Um, the world might not be as a such a bad place as my mind wants me to think right now. And the third step, of course, is to then make a priority to nourish calm and clarity. And as I said, it's a process. It's not something we can snip our fingers and have clarity back. But it's almost like, I, I call it the following way in my understanding. The, the, the body gets a flu quite often. Yeah. We get sick. We get coughing, sneezing. We had this all winter. Everyone, we were from November till March. Someone was sick in my family. So, um, it can be quite a long period. <laughs> and, and we're very accepting. We, we know that bodies get flus, yeah, and they get sick and they sneeze and they cough, um, for all winter. What about the mind? Well, the mind can get a flu as well. Those depressive episodes, minor ones yeah and then there are of course on the scale um worse ones as well moments of anxiety moments of deep restlessness yeah our heart minds can get the flu as well moments where we didn't do anything wrong and nothing bad happened but we kind of slip into an, an, an episode in our lives where it gets darker feels more dangerous feels more challenging sometimes for a good reason and sometimes for no good reason yeah, and I call this, oh, I wake up and I notice I'm grumpy all week long. So, you know, my mind has caught the flu and now I need to work with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and in that episode to say, okay, that is the mind state. That is what is there. I'm going to be very accepting of it. And at the same time, I plant the seeds for calm and clarity and balance to re-arise more likely sooner than later. So these are practices I spoke about a lot in other sessions, practices of grounding and soothing and balancing, practices of friendliness and compassion to calm the being. And by the way, our next week together will be about compassion. So that might be a puzzle piece uh, you could add to that practice. The mind wants us in states of confusion, clarity to do things and to make things happen and uh, to think of, at least to think about things. And for me, it's a, a trust in the capacity of calm and clarity to say none of that. None of that. I'm so confused. What I read, need right now is a nap, a walk in nature, um, a couple of silent minutes, a bit of caring, really nourishing meditation where I don't need to achieve anything. And that from a very personal point of view, I might go to practices when I know need grounding and soothing. Yeah. A little self massage, some Tai Chi, some yoga, yeah, and to give priority to that. And that comes with this appreciation of the basic sanity, yeah, which I talked about in the beginning. Now, to end with, um, I made up my own simile. Let's see how that works <laughs> in the good tradition of the Buddha. Just to let you know that you will lose clarity many times, maybe even starting today, maybe you're even in it, yeah. And in those times, you can get really anxious to say, oh, how can I maneuver the world without clarity? We still have mindfulness as our friend. 
Yeah, we can, we're not completely lost. Mindfulness is going to be able to bring us in contact with situations. And we might need to rely a little bit more on mindfulness in those times. What is happening now and now and now? What is happening and what is story in addition to it? We might need to rely a little bit more on our integrity. Yeah. What are my values? What am I living by? Even if I'm confused, can I remember my values? One of my deep grained values might be not to harm anyone or to be honest and sincere or to not take to not take more than I really need and is given to me, etc. And then to orientate towards that which feels calming. So the simile is that clarity is like a very wise and beloved friend of ours. In its company, we like to walk even on challenging mountain paths. We're not afraid. Yeah. But just imagine you walk with it on a mountain path and suddenly a thick fog comes up, really thick. And we lose sight of our friend. And as a consequence, now our guide and companion is, is, is gone into the fog. We might feel really afraid and lost. But to stand there and do nothing will not bring us our friend back. Yeah? It will not bring us our friend back. It will not get us out, um, off of the mountain. So rather than getting agitated, we just notice, oh, friend is gone, clarity is gone. And to run after him and shout and, and, and um, might even be dangerous. Yeah. So we use this sense of feeling lost as an indicator that now we need to be careful. Now we need to, to walk back with, with a lot of care and compassion for ourselves. Yeah, to say, oh, dear one, this is challenging. Let me be very intimate with my experience right now. We might stand and still and mom for a moment and orientate ourselves and where am I? Where is the path? Okay. And then we carefully go one step at a time, one step at a time. And we slowly walk and walk very mindfully. And after some time, the fog will lift. We will come down the, tra um, the, the trail and then there stands our friend. And of course, of course, he or she or they, they wait for us. Yeah. They are not gone. They don't want to be away. <laughs> they wait for us to embrace us again. And we can continue walking with each other. So there is a possibility to maneuver in your life, even if clarity is not there. And to plant the little seeds for clarity to arise again. And I wish from the bottom of my heart that we all experience our basic sanity today. That clarity will be our safe guide. And that we have enough trust in our capacity for of integrity and mindfulness in those times the clarity is not so close a companion as we wish it would be. Thank you for listening. So, practice, practice time. Would you like to find yourself a posture so that we put little seeds of clarity, very seeds, little seeds of clarity, um, into our heart minds. You can practice sitting and standing and lying down. And you are very much welcomed. Welcome yourself to the cushion, the chair, the sofa, the mattress, wherever you stand, the room you're in. Whether you're clear or not, whether you're in a happy mood or not, Like if someone opens the door of a hammam, a, a, a spa, a sacred resting place to you and saying, well, I don't really care whether you're fit or unfit, whether you're clear or unclear, you, well, you're in for a treat. And that can't, can't be of harm to treat ourselves well. If there is a lot of thinking and thought this morning, just welcome it. Say, oh, Mara, you are quite displaying me a show this morning. You make me see the word in different colors. You show me what you find, what you want me to believe is important and challenging. Say, oh, I know, I see all that.
you know what, Mara, maybe that's true and maybe it's not. But we can know one thing, that none of that is so important that it has to bother you in the next 20 minutes. After that, fine, we're in for the ride. But for the next 20 minutes, none of that is so important that it should keep you from soothing, calming yourself. We start with a couple of generous, pleasant cycles of breath. As if breathing, the air is gently poured into your lungs, supposed to fill you and nourish you. Maybe your breath body is a contracted vessel this morning, so be gentle. Be gentle with the air, no pressing, no pushing, no stuffing. And with the exhale, may some of the tension leave the body. And then we do a little thing. If the mind is active, if the emotional realm is very active this morning, what about just very gently swaying? If you're lying down from, um, if you're sitting from the right to the left or if you're standing. Just a very gentle, maybe hardly noticeable sway. Just noticing the shift of weight, of balance in your feet or in your sitting bones. And if you're lying down, you might just notice the rocking rhythm of breathing. Almost allow your body to be moved a little, like Sea grass, young birches in the wind. And just see whether this rocking makes it easier to connect with the body sense of weight and almost a soothing dynamic. Allow all the other things, the thoughts and the emotions, they're all welcome to stay. We don't put, need to push them away. We just highlight that which is calm and soothing and grounded and earthy. Just see if you can get a little more intimate with these experiences which soothe you this morning.
Notice whether the body stores up a lot of energy to brace yourself against the world and experiences, as if you are the knight in the shining armor. And just see whether you can lay down some of that armor, a sense of holding something tight in the body, almost allowing that to melt, melt, melt. There is nothing to do and nowhere to go at the moment. And right in this moment, all the conflicts and challenging situations, they are not there. Mara might still mirror you that you need to worry about that. But actually, this little moment is free, free from this challenge, free from this responsibility. It's even free of the need to figure yourself out. Let go of the self-reference and checking in if you're okay and all right. What would help you to arrive a little bit more in this moment? What story, what belief, what view, what challenge could you see through? Not here right now. Not that it might not become back later or be of importance later, but you take a holiday from it. So I'm on vacation to nourish myself. And then tune in with that which feels comfortable, soft, or just okay in the body, in that which you touch or say or um, hear. If that feels too narrow, you can open up your eyes and look around and see something beautiful or just interesting. Just show that to the mind, to the hard mind. Mirror it back. This is a safe moment, even a pleasant moment. 
Do the best of your abilities. Maybe your attention is like a bird this morning, anxious little bird flying off very quickly. On the smallest of triggers, it's off again. That's okay. Just offer a nest to come back to. Every moment the bird of attention can land for an inhale just, or an exhale, is a small seed of clarity, of calm planted. And if you're off daydreaming or into the to-do list of today or the challenges of yesterday, no problem. The mind will wander. Now is the time to find something comfortable, something pleasant, something or oh, maybe just neutral and unalarming to show to your hide mind. Look at that. Let's stay with this for maybe a breath, maybe two. And I just would like to do at the end a little experiment with you. Just become aware of your hands and your fingers, wherever they are at the moment. Hands, palms, fingers, the lovely sensitivity within. And just check, just know to what degree you're capable of being in touch, being intimate. To 
know and to see the hands with the hide mind. Maybe even with some love and affection for those wonderful two hands. Supporting us on so many levels each and every day. And for a moment, just notice, how do you know? How do you know that you're in contact? How do you know that there is a little amount of clarity within some capacity to see and be with something? Okay, and then I'd like you to start gently moving those hands and fingers and toes and feet. Maybe some stretching and moving, so maybe some yawning and sighing. <clears throat> and then slowly, slowly you can make your progression back to the screen. So, that was an exploration of, of clarity, or maybe also an invitation of how to yeah, make the rest and make the soothing a priority in our practice. And in my practice, and it might be a case for you as well, it's quite often the case that there mm, isn't an easy ride. <laughs> Meditation isn't always easy. And at, if at the end of the meditation you come out and say, well, no, nah, still pretty busy and still pretty agitated, um, it's not the goal to clear the mind every time. And it might not even be possible. I think it, at times meditation is a bit more like housekeeping. Yeah, I constantly clear out these rooms and get the kids stuff somewhere. Yeah, and it's never finished. And um, sometimes it can be so frustrating because you have the feeling of, oh, I only got the, the peak of the iceberg done. Same with our minds, just the peak of the iceberg calmed. Yeah? Um, and we completely forget to appreciate, to appreciate the beauty of this work, to say, where wouldn't we be without it? Yeah, It would be a mess, it would be a disaster in here, definitely. <laughs> and most probably we would suffer much more if we wouldn't come and do our gentle, humble practice of soothing and calming and clarifying every day yeah so that we don't think we need to bring in calm and perfect clarity every time it's more of meeting our hearts minds and nourishing them at least a tiny bit to the best of our abilities okay so now is the time now is the time to share now is the time to maybe reflect on the week. I would love for to hear if there is anything you take away with you from the week, maybe a little inspiration. Just one, one thing would be enough, yeah. Um, or any questions you have, anything you would like to share with us would be lovely to hear about. Thank you. So Steph is writing that she feels some lovely space and rest with this practice giving herself permission to set the worrying thoughts aside. That is great. It's so often about this permission. Yeah. And I think this is part of the reason why guided meditations work for some like a charm and it doesn't work when we're on our own. Yeah. Because my voice kind of carries the authority of giving you permission to really rest. Yeah. And it's something towards work towards to said, I have the own inner authority to allow myself to rest now. Thank you, Mara, for showing me all that. And I allow myself to rest now. Yeah. So, yeah, there is this. To give oneself a treat has resonated. Yeah, meditation can be that. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Sometimes it feels like labor and work. But it can be that. I need a treat now. I need to be very gently soft and soothing and nourishing. That is what I need from my practice right now. And 
just this little sentence I repeated over and over again in courses, the practice, including mindfulness and meditation, it serves you. You're not the servants of your practice. Yeah, it serves really you to have that liberation and ease and open heartedness in your lives. That's often a huge misunderstanding when we think we should fill out uh, practice. No practice should fill out you and almost adapt to the needs in your life. Yeah, the, the sentence meditation is like housework resonated as well. I love that. It reduces mind meditation to something almost a little bit trivial, where we, we read so much about huge states of experience and charming experiences and in, um, create a great opening of consciousness. What if it's just like housekeeping at times? Those experiences, they might be there, they come occasionally, but most of the time it will be this housekeeping, this reclaiming of basic sanity over and over again. Yeah. Now, Beate, what means soothing? I, I type it down. down. Soothing is um, beruhigen, calming the calming the, the heart mind to almost like if you have a, a small child which is all agitated, you take it in your arm and over time, only over time, it will kind of let go of its anxiety and, and arrive in this moment with you. Yeah. First of all, it's it's governed by Mara and all the agitation and its, its, its story and its assumption of the world. And in your embrace and in your softness and in your steadiness with it, it can arrive back in this present moment. And that's part of the soothing process to bring something back into presence and calm. Great. Laura's writing. Recently, I had a moment of clarity which gave me the proper words to write to a friend concerning a problem between us which created peace. I felt the clarity came from the thin air outside myself. Yeah, not from within. Where does it come from? Why does it come when we're not looking for it? Great. Now, sometimes it's the freedom of the, of the self reference. Yeah. I need to do, I am this, you are that. And we're so clearly defined. Yeah. I have done this. You have done that. I'm such a person. You're such a person. But we, we're so almost boxed in, yeah, that we are re reacting basically out of the same habits and patterns and perspectives with each other. Um, all, and always the same game, this place, yeah. And sometimes if we, um, yeah, kind of shift the, shift the perspective on the situation, when we become more than just this small format idea of ourselves, we get fresh ideas, we get fresh perspectives on the, on the, on the situation. I had this in a mindful, mindful communication workshop, this exercise, where I said, shift the perspective from, I am in this situation with you, which is just two opposites sitting with each other. And imagine you would be someone looking at that relationship, um, with a caring perspective, not for the one or the other, for just the relationship. Yeah. And it, what you describe, Laura, kind of to me in my interpretation sounds similar, that there was a shift of perspective on the situation. The calm, the clarity allowed the self-referencing to whoo, calm down. And in that moment, just like I described yesterday, potential new views and perspectives open up. Yeah. Thank you, Chill, for the very sweet words. I'm happy to contribute something here. Yeah. And thank you all for this week's beautiful contributions. It makes the session so much richer to have your questions and your reflections and your sharings. Anyone else wanting to write something? Wanting to share something? Wanting to ask something? Anything you take away from this week? Yeah, Ingrid is writing this, that this theme Moha makes it so clear, the unconscious processes in my heart mind, that it's there all the time. Beautiful. And that's, I believe, 
sometimes we can be poof, overwhelmed by that because it feels a lot. But to just have this capacity to know and see, bring something to the light of awareness will make an immense difference over time. You might not be seeing it immediately, but just to notice that there are unconscious processes and to have some awareness from for them, not a, a focused, laser-sharp mm, mindfulness which wants to see and understand and analyze everything, but just this notice of, yeah, I'm driven right now. I'm pushed forwards. I'm pushed away. I'm oh, entangled in this experience. That can be so helpful, saying, ah, oh, at the moment, only 30% clarity. Let me be, be steady with that. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Martina. She's reflecting back the, the concept of basic sanity. Yeah, that's it. We don't need to become sages and wise people. I think if we establish basic sanity as the first thing, um, that would be wonderful. It would be so helpful for us and others. And that can, has maybe sounds like a more humane approach to work towards just basic sanity today. And it also is opening up a, lot, a huge pace of compassion within myself. I've been in moments without basic sanity. I know that is suffering. Yeah, I deeply know that for myself. I know I did not want that. I did not bring that upon myself. I could not make it immediately go away. And I'm just reminded that others go through that on the days and on the weeks and on the months. And my heart is with them. Yeah, and so maybe we can open up to each other knowing that basic sanity is not something we can take for granted. And if someone else is going through a phase without basic sanity, can we just know that? Can we just know that? Britta's sharing. My breathing has come more home during the, this morning. I realize I so rarely allow myself to soften and take care of the beauty of life. Great, Britta. Thank you. Thank you. And remember, remember that like a pearl. That, that, that the power which is in the softening and the taking care of. It's like in after the softening and the taking care of, the soothing, all other good things follow. The clarity follows, the presence follows, the wisdom follows, the integrity follows. So can we, like I said before, emphasize the softening, the soothing, the nourishing, the calming? Yeah. Great. Laura is sharing that helps to delve into our daily problems and how to deal with them. Yeah, great, great, great. That's why mindfulness and meditation should be nourishing. It's the daily nitty gritty. None of us um, should have like a double existence, like my existence, my identity of the meditator, which is supposed to be far away from the daily life and this nitty gritty stuff and my house, housework and the problems with my spouse and my children and my friends and my work. Um, that creates friction, friction in our lives. Uh, a spiritual life is supposed to look like that. And then there is all this stuff. <laughs> um, now I would say that is an unhelpful perspective. Yeah. That is an unhelpful perspective. Meditation, any spiritual practice should embrace the humanness we are all living in and should embrace the nitty gritty of the daily life. Mm. Yeah, chill is sharing. Meditation is not a boot camp. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, great. So I'm coming back, um, I think, in two months' time, and then we're going to talk about compassion. Yeah, and compassion is an immensely helpful tool, and it's one of the most misunderstood tools in our in our, in our mindfulness meditation uh, realms. So let's really dive into compassion and understand that, so that it can become the tool, can become the tool we actually need. And I'm looking forward to be again with you then. I also wish to share with you, I, I only get a possibility during these sessions, I don't get one afterwards. So let me thank you for the financial support and the donations you've already given in the past. Um, thank you so much for, for all of that. And yeah, just the invitation maybe to see each other again in either in two, two months time on the compassion theme, or you might want to consider the uh, to join 
uh, this, the sutta studies, which might start again after summer break. So we're looking into the Buddha's discourses at the moment together. Then we have a pause in basically August, and we'll pick up if enough people come together in September to dive into more into those ancient discourses. And last but not least, we're going to potentially have our Dharma Yatra, our um, um, pilgrimage in the summer, and where we're going to out in nature for 10 days and come together and meditate together in southern Germany, if you wish to. Um, there are still spaces open until the 21st of May. And uh, you could go to my homepage, which I just type in, and you find the description of it there. Okay, that has been the advertisement slot. And do it like Robin and send that has been advertisement. She wants me to uh, come to another session with her. And yes, I deeply want to. I want to share and uh, practice with you as much as possible. I quite enjoyed being here this week. So anything else you want me to? Yeah, lovely messages. Encouragement for sensitivity and basic sanity. Yeah. And Patricia, Patricia is sharing as well that the theme of Moha has been uh, important and the middle way concept has become clearer. I love to hear that. Okay. So thank you so much for all of you to come. And I'll leave the chat room open for you just to say goodbye to each other. Um, enjoy your week. Enjoy your weekend. And uh, I'd be very happy to see you again in the future. Thank you so much.